What's up, you guys? How y'all doing? I have returned for a recap of the C of the Seattle Supercross at Lumen Field, and holy smokes, did we have a race! Now I did watch the replay, although I because I didn't watch it live because I was out covering a uh, Hawaii softball and a doubleheader with the uh, UH versus CSUN, and you'll see a recap video for that. But before I get to the Seattle recap for the recap for Seattle, just remember guys, subscribe. That's how my channel grows. I'm closing in on 10,700 subscribers and I want to make it to 11 K. And then the only way I can do that is with your help and not to mention keeping my monetization status. So, so double check if you're subscribed, if you haven't, if you're uh, unsubscribed, just I hope you subscribe again. And uh, if you think I'm worth listening to with these uh, recap videos, just hit the subscribe button. So anyway, guys, Seattle's in the books. Let's get into this. I'm going to put up my banner here. I'm going to start with the 250s. Granted, there may not be a lot to talk about. Levi Kitchen took the win. Gate to checkers. That actually surprised me. But then again, at the same time, it didn't. Because, because Levi Kitchen is... A Seattle or a, a Washington native. He's from Washuga, Washington. Wouldn't surprise me if he actually lives on or near the Washuga property, the Washuga track, you know, you know, the Washuga track. But still, Levi Kitchen winning that race, gate to flag, kind of surprised me. And at the same time, it didn't surprise me because he is from Washington. That's the part that didn't surprise me. What did surprise me was the fact that Kitchen was able to get a good start and lead Gate to flag because I thought that someone like Shimoda who would excel on a track like this, like what we saw in Seattle, I thought Shimoda might come through. But also at the same time, I kind of thought my prediction for the Western title, RJ Hampshire would come through. But it's starting to look more and more like Levi Kitchen is going to deliver Mitch Payton and Pro Circuit Kawasaki a long awaited title. And that's something that Mitch Payton hasn't had to celebrate in at least 10 years. Because the last guy I can remember for Pro Circuit who won a title was probably uh, Brock Tickle. And the closest that they got was probably Joey Savacci in 2017 until. Zach Osborne put him down on the final lap. And, uh, but then again, this is completely off the top of my head because I know that Adam C and Cirillo didn't win the East title in, in 2019. And I think Austin Fortner also lost out on the Western title as well. This, the very same year. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, Levi Kitchen, if you're looking for someone who can deliver, Kitchen seems to be the guy for Mitch Payton. And uh, I got to wonder if uh, if Shimoda might be regretting going to Honda again, going back to Honda after how terrible the Kawasaki supposedly was last year. And last year, their Pro Circuit's, Pro Circuit's force was pretty much depleted. Because, because of injury. I mean, Fortner was out. Cameron McAdoo was out. Just about everybody except Joe Shimoda had gone down with an within injury. And now Max Volan is out for the rest of the Supercross season. I really hope that that guy can buy a break because he needs some good to come his way in the worst possible way. Because for Max Volan, his career could pretty much be a flash in the pan if all these injuries come up. He could be like Trey Kennard, who, after winning the 250 title and <clears throat> just losing and winning in Supercross in 2008 and then winning the motocross title in 2010, injuries just derailed his career over and over and over again. And I'm starting to see a, a similar thing with uh, 
Max Volan, and it isn't really anything he's doing wrong. <clears throat> and that's really disappointing. Not going to lie to you. <clears throat> so hopefully that Volan can find some. So hopefully Volan can find a little balance and uh, <clears throat> come back with a vengeance in outdoors. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm trying to clear my throat a little bit here. But still, Kitchen getting the, the win was <clears throat> a great win. Was a great thing to happen to him. And am I willing to change my prediction? No. I still think that R.J. Hampshire has something for him. But R.J. Hampshire has got to buy a start. And so does Joe Shimoda. But it seems like Shimoda is such a head case. Like, it takes him until almost the very end of the almost the very end of his night to finally figure out the track. And if Shimoda can figure out the track the same way McGrath did through his racing career, Shimoda can win a title. And right now it looks like this title is pretty much out of reach. So I really hope that Honda can, can kind of show, can kind of show a, a little gratitude and maybe a, show a little leniency and give, Shimoda a second chance because you know everyone you know what they say everyone deserves a second chance and and quite frankly if you set your expectations too high that can cause someone a crack really and I think KTM did that with Max Volan when he was under their under their tent and for for them to like kind of just go after him the way that they did it's just not cool. I mean, look at what happened with Caleb Russell when he at when he wanted to give motocross a chance after 10 titles, I think 10 straight titles in GNCC. He decides to give motocross a chance and he retires after four events because reportedly KTM put so much pressure on him when they really didn't need to. And if you're KTM, you got to be thinking, what's the logic in that? Really? Because you want to let a guy grow. You have to let the guy grow. It's like going through college. You have to let their students make mistakes. And if you don't let them make mistakes, not only are they not going to learn, but it could become a hostile environment to a point where maybe the rider could actually fight the crew or maybe get into fist fights with the crew like how Bale and Stanton did when they were under Honda. And that can lead to some dire results. So anyway, I thought I'd keep the four, the 250 short. The 450 class has a lot to talk about. Now, Chase Sexton was leading most of the race until he stalled in this heat race and in the main. And that actually took me by surprise. But then again, that Seattle track was another one of those tracks where anything that could go wrong did. And for Chase Sexton, anything that could have gone wrong did because he stalled in the heat race and stalled in the main, and Cooper Webb got around him, and even at, and he didn't even have to use that new line over the wall jump that Jet Lawrence was using. And when Jet Lawrence had ended up crashing into Cooper Webb, I thought for sure that was a case of Jet being over-anxious. Now, don't get me wrong. Jet Lawrence still doesn't need an instruction manual for the 450, but I'm actually more worried about him in 2025 because – that's going to be year two in the 450 class. And uh, and you all know what happened with Ryan Dungey way back in 2011. Because in 2010, he won both the Supercross title and the Motocross title as a 450 rookie. And he went from winning five races in Supercross and nine races in a row in Motocross, 10 overall, to winning only one Supercross and maybe only a handful of outdoor Motocross races in 2011, which led me to believe that Dungey was above and beyond spoiled in 2010 because all the competition was on the sidelines. I mean, Stewart was out with injury. Chad Reed was out with injury. Andrew Short was out with injury. Josh Grant was out with injury. That's four guys right there. And not, and eventually joined that list at St. Louis. So you see what I'm getting at here? 
That's why I kind of felt that Dungey was above and beyond spoiled in 2010. And not to take anything away from Dungey, because he had an outstanding year. And when everything comes your way, everything comes your way. It's your When it's your year, it's your year. Not going to lie to you. Same goes for Hawaii men's basketball when they won it all in 2016, when they won the Big West title and won the series. And at the same time, they ended up making it all the way to the second round of the NCAA basketball tournament. And since then, they've been trying to fight their way back in there, and they've only been able to win two tournament games in the last seven or eight years. So the way that I see it is that if Jet Lawrence has his ass handed to him in 2025, he may not necessarily feel the same way that Jeremy McGrath did. Because on one end of the spectrum, you could look at it as McGrath was a rookie in 93, and he ends up winning 10 races en route to the title. And then he goes on and demolishes the field for four straight years, winning 43 races. And some people thought that McGrath was going to retire young. But instead, he decides to keep racing, and he set, and he sets a record of 72 wins. And that's a record that may very well be set in stone, considering the way that Eli Tomac has been riding this year. And I think that Eli Tomac has been the biggest disappointment of 2024. I'm not afraid to say that either. I might get to that in a little bit, but... Or make that into another video. But then again, I already did kind of speculate that Eli Tomac could be ending his career like Doug Henry did. But then again, you never know. But still, as far as Jet Lawrence is concerned, yeah, he was a little over anxious there. But still, like I said, I'd be more concerned about what happens to him in 2025. Because if he doesn't win as many races as he is this year, there's a pretty good chance that Jet Lawrence could certainly have his ass handed to him and not have the same way and not have the same kind of treatment that McGrath had. And like I was saying earlier, when you look at it on one side of the spectrum, Jeremy McGrath was a rookie in 93 and he got away with it for four years. And then Honda comes out with a new Honda comes out with a new bike and, uh, it got to a point where McGrath hated riding that bike. And he ended up signing with Suzuki for 97. Okay? I hope you see where I'm getting at here because, I mean, a lot of you could say that, oh, well, Jeremy didn't get away with it. He has so much natural talent. That's right. Am I saying he got away with it? No. Am I implying he got away with it for so long? No. Because... McGrath used natural talent, was naturally gifted, and he just saw the tracks and he just saw the tracks differently. He added a new style. Jet Lawrence is doing the same thing here. And he's kind of reflecting some of the things that McGrath did. Almost like Chad Reed in a sense, like Chad Reed did when he first came into the 250 class. And Davy Coombs was, was I remember Davy Coombs saying that. That Reed reminded him of McGrath so much. But anyway, as far as Chase Sexton is concerned, I was thinking that he was going to win this one. Because at this point in the season, you would think that Chase Sexton would have won at least two or three more times as of now. And instead, he's only got one win in the in that quagmire of a mud fest at San Francisco. And I thought, well, Sexton, he needed that win. And quite frankly, I hope Chase Sexton doesn't lose any sleep over that. Because Sexton probably rode the best he rode all season long on a semi-dry track. Let's face it. We all know what we saw. That was Sexton's on a silver platter. And had he not stalled it, he would very well have walked away with the win. Okay? So... Honestly, I was surprised that Cooper Webb came away with the win in a sense. But then again, Webb has pulled off some miracles before. I mean, is a title out of reach? No. But when you look at mathematics alone, it's not out of reach. But then again, you never know what can happen. I mean, 16 points is a sizable gap for Jet Lawrence, but it's not a gimme. 
I mean, look at what happened to Grant Langston in the 125 motocross championship in 01 when he had that sizable gap of nine points over Mike Brown. And then Langston's rear wheel crapped on him with a lap, with a lap and a half to go, or maybe three laps to go, rather. And I look at Christoph Purcell. He had a, a big lead on Trey Kennard in the 2010 title in motocross. And then Purcell crashes in the first moto at Unadilla. And he practically just let that title get away. Not going to lie to you. And then in Supercross, you look at what happened to James Stewart in 11 when he had so many of those crashes and all those finishes outside the top 10 despite winning five winning five events. That did Stewart in. You see what I'm getting at here? So, I mean, you never know what can happen with 16 points. And, and of course... As Greg Albertine once said, anything can happen at any time. Nobody's not human. Jet Lawrence is human. He's proven it. Even after sweeping the motocross season last year, something that I thought would never be done again after James Stewart did in 08. So you never know what can happen. I mean, Jet could fall and break an ankle or or twist his, or twist his knee. Or he could have a mechanical problem. And you sure hate to see the title being decided that way. So, anyway, guys, that's all for today. And remember, subscribe. You'll see a recap video on uh, the last softball game that I attended, the doubleheader or three-game series with University of Hawaii versus Cal State Northridge. This is for softball, like I said. You'll see a recap for that later in the week. And in the meantime, thanks for watching. And remember, subscribe, and we'll see you all for the next race. So thanks, guys. Catch you all later. Subscribe, everyone.